And you'll find a copy of this graph here on your very first section. I'd like you to follow along because I believe that we're all in this room at least like slightly hypoglycemic, whether you know it or not, or you may have type 2 diabetes, which you probably do know. So I'm going to show you here what symptoms come from, and you may get one of these symptoms, you may get a cluster of them. Let me show you what happens and how it's developed. Before anyone gets hypoglycemic, they start out normal. And let's just say your blood sugar before breakfast is normal at about 90 milligrams per deciliter. You eat something, it breaks down into sugar, and the blood sugar level comes up, maybe to 140 or so. Now, if you're a type 1 diabetic, you don't produce any insulin at all. And then your blood sugar goes sky high, goes up 3, 4, 5, 600, and you have to inject insulin or have an insulin pump. But in a normal healthy individual, you start out and you release a little bit of insulin, which is represented by this light blue arrow, and over the next few hours, your blood sugar comes down to a normal level, somewhere around where it was before you ate anything. So you eat something, it breaks down into sugar, the blood sugar comes up to about 140, a little bit of insulin comes out, over the next few hours, it brings the blood sugar down, you go for a few hours, you start getting hungry, you eat something again, it goes up slowly and then down slowly. So it fluctuates in this range in here, and if it does so, your brain works, your body works, you have plenty of energy for exercise or play. You have plenty of uh, brain energy to think, concentrate, remember, and have healthy emotions. Now, what happens in most of us is the following. Again, we used to call this hypoglycemia. Now we call it unstable blood sugar. You could start out at the same point. You cannot rule out hypoglycemia nor type 2 diabetes from a fasting sugar alone. So you eat something and it breaks down into sugar and the blood sugar level comes up maybe to the same place. But the difference is what happens in most of us, instead of a little bit of insulin, your body releases way too much. Maybe five or ten times too much insulin comes out. It's what we call excess insulin release. And when that happens, your blood sugar drops down a roller coaster crash down here somewhere. And that's what we call low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. Well, when the blood sugar drops like that, it robs the brain and the body of energy. And you can get a bunch of different symptoms, including fatigue, just general tiredness, headaches, including migraines. Concentration difficulties, cloudy thinking, short-term memory loss. I used to have this a great deal when I was so hypoglycemic. Uh, depression and mood swings. It's not a Prozac deficiency, but sometimes it's this low blood sugar problem. Learning disorders in children, not a Ritalin deficiency. That's just the way they treat it. Uh, a four o'clock slump in energy, sleepiness after meals, sugar cravings are all very common symptoms when your blood sugar is falling down too fast or too far. If nothing stops it, your blood sugar may go all the way down to zero. If it does, then you'll pass out, go into a coma, and then you'll die because you can't live with a zero blood sugar. And your brain realizes this. So when your blood sugar is screaming down real fast and real far, your brain has to declare an emergency to stop it, causing a release of adrenaline from your adrenal glands. And the adrenaline comes out and does a good job of bringing that blood sugar back up to a safe level for the brain and the body. And then the emergency is over. That's the good news. The bad news is all this adrenaline circulating around can contribute to a lot of symptoms like nervousness, anxiety, irritability, hyperactivity in children, heart palpitations and people that have a heart sensitivity, insomnia if it happens at night, you may get to sleep fine and then wake up around 3 in the morning, toss and turn, can't get back to sleep, that's because your blood sugar dropped and all the adrenaline's coming out. Also uh, hot flashes sometimes in women, uh, acid indigestion, nausea, lack of appetite. Many people get trapped in the middle with a depressed anxiety or the tension fatigue syndrome or learning disorders and hyperactivity in children. We used to think that fatigue was the most common symptom of hypoglycemia, it's not, it's anxiety. Anxiety is the number one symptom, walking around wired and sometimes tired because of all this adrenaline that's flooding out of your system all the time. Where does it start? Well, one is too much sugar intake in our diet. The average American today is having 25 teaspoons of sugar per day. 25 teaspoons of sugar is a whole lot of sugar. Sugar does cause a loss of uh, certain minerals. You lose zinc, chromium, manganese, and magnesium in the urine from all that sugar intake. So even if you didn't have any sugar recently, but when you're growing up you had a ton of sugar, you may have these mineral deficiencies now on your analysis. And if you do, if you see this arrow going back this way, even if you don't eat any sugar at all, but have these mineral deficiencies or imbalances, this arrow goes back, that can cause excess insulin release and cause this drop in blood sugar. And that's what we call a chemical or a nutritional hypoglycemia. You may not have any refined sugar at all, but if these minerals are low or out of balance, then that can cause this excess insulin release and drop the blood sugar down. Initially, when you're starting out and it's a hypoglycemic, you're producing a lot of insulin and most of it works. The pink arrow shows the functional level of insulin. So you're producing a lot of insulin that works, your blood sugar goes down. But as time goes on, especially as chromium and manganese start going lower and lower and lower, you're still producing a ton of insulin, but maybe only half of it works for blood sugar control. When we don't have much insulin working, then your blood sugar starts going up and up and up, and that's called type 2 diabetes. 
there is no mystery where type 2 diabetes comes from. It's from high refined sugar, high carbohydrates, and mineral deficiencies. If we can correct these mineral deficiencies, knock out sugar, and go on a very low carbohydrate diet, then you can usually begin to improve your blood sugar metabolism and maybe even reverse the type 2 diabetes. But the way they're treating it in this country is absolutely backwards. The dietitians and the diabetologists put type 2 diabetics on a um, low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet, and that's guaranteed to make you worse and worse and worse. And what about this insulin? Insulin itself causes problems. Besides all these problems, insulin stores body fat and also blocks fat breakdown. So we've had people on low-fat, high-carb diets for years that weren't able to lose weight. Then they go on something like an Atkins diet or Sugar Busters or South Beach diet. They knock out sugar and carbs. That knocks out the insulin. All of a sudden, they're able to lose weight easily. But the third and fourth symptoms of too much insulin, high risk for cancer and heart disease. Just a few days ago, they reported that cancer has overtaken heart disease. They usually battle one and two for the number of deaths in this country. So now the number one killer is cancer. The number two right behind it is heart disease. Well, the number one, number two killers in this country in part come from too much insulin. Let me show you those studies. In the British Medical Journal in the year 2000, they had two groups of women. Both groups of women had a history of breast cancer in their own bodies. One group had high insulin levels. One group had low insulin levels. The group that had the highest insulin levels with a history of breast cancer were not 20, 30, or 40 percent more likely to die of breast cancer. They were 800 percent more likely to die of breast cancer than women who also had a history but whose insulin levels were low. So it behooves women to be on a lower carb, no sugar diet and take fish oil and vitamin E and other antioxidants to protect themselves. What about heart disease? Well, in men, there was a study on heart disease and insulin. And this was a 22 year study in Helsinki, Finland. And the men were 34 to 64 years of age. None of the participants showed any sign of heart disease, diabetes or other cardiovascular disease when the study started. That's called a prospective study. You start here and you see what happens in the future. Well, they watched them for 22 years and they found that, especially in the first five years, if you had high insulin levels, you were 300% more likely to die of a heart attack in this group than men who didn't have high insulin levels. They showed during that 22 years of follow-up, the men with the highest insulin levels consistently at greater risk of developing heart disease than those at the lowest levels. They go on to say the findings suggest the predictive power of insulin was of the same magnitude as that of cholesterol levels. We already know that high cholesterol equals heart disease risk. Now we know that high insulin equals a risk for heart disease. Where was this published? In the journal Circulation, which is published by the American Heart Association. So now the American Heart Association knows that if you eat more sugar, you have a higher insulin level, and that gives you a higher risk for heart disease. So what's the American Heart Association do? They give us a list of heart-healthy foods. They put their heart check seal of approval on foods they are telling us are healthy for our heart. That's the good news. The bad news is where we cut this from was this box of Fruit Loops. So you have the American Heart Association endorsing garbage foods like Fruit Loops and sugared Pop-Tarts and foods that are loaded with sugar when their own studies show that sugar causes heart disease. So stay away from anything the American Heart Association tells you to eat and you'll be fine. Now what about sugar substitutes? We're telling you to avoid refined sugar. What can you use? So one that's safe for everybody, whether you're a hypoglycemic or a diabetic or anywhere in between, is stevia. S-T-E-V-I-A. Stevia is a natural herbal-based sweetener and it's available in health food stores. It comes in liquid or it comes in bulk powder or it comes in little green packets that you can add to your tea or whatever. If your triglycerides are not high, you can use fructose, which is a five carbon sugar, or honey, a little bit of molasses, a little bit of maple syrup. Fructose you can see in packets also like in Publix or other markets and a little bit of fructose is okay if your triglycerides are not high. The sugar alcohols are fine by the way both ways. Even if your triglycerides are high, the sugar alcohols are fine. Sorbitol, maltitol, xylitol, mannitol, Anything that ends in an OL like that is a sugar alcohol. Unsafe for rats, but safe for humans is saccharin. Saccharin is found in sweet and low in the pink packets. Has never been shown to cause cancer in humans, ever. And basically, if you're out stuck somewhere at a restaurant and you're going to put a sweetener in your herbal tea, let's say, um, and you have a choice between the white packet, the pink packet, the yellow packet, or the blue packet, always pick the pink. Next on the list, which is safer than aspartame, which isn't saying much, it's like saying safer than arsenic, is Splenda. Splenda or sucralose is safer than aspartame. And I promise you that's not saying very much for it. So the one you want to avoid at all costs is aspartame, NutraSweet, equal, and don't ever have that again if you can avoid it. And it's also now called Neotame, N-E-O-T-A-M-E. -E. So this is actually a picture of the molecule. I won't go through all the uh, propaganda they say there on the right-hand side, but 
They do say it's metabolized by digestive enzymes to naturally occurring dietary components. They show you right at the company where it breaks down. This is the whole news right here. Every time you swallow one molecule of aspartame, it breaks down into two places to make three chemicals. One, two, three. The one on the left is aspartic acid, and that's a naturally occurring amino acid. I think it does cause some problems for some people, but most people are okay with aspartic acid. One in the middle, phenylalanine, actually does cause some problems for some people. We're going to show you this in just a second. That affects the brain and central nervous system. The real big news here is the little guy over here on the right, CH3O, goes to CH3OH, and that's methanol or wood alcohol. If you go to uh, the hardware store later today and buy a bottle of methanol, you'll see a skull and crossbones on it because it's one of the most toxic compounds that humans can swallow. Now, if you want all the dirt on this and, and where it came from and how it ever got approved, uh, it's on this website, doorway.com with one O, D-O-R-W-A-Y.com. There's also a very good movie. If you or someone you care about needs convincing about this, there's a very good movie called Sweet Misery, and that was made by soundandfuryproductions.com. And what about the phenylalanine? Well, this one in the middle here breaks down into the neurotransmitters called catecholamines. Aspartame gives you phenylalanine. Phenylalanine goes into tyrosine and then dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, and finally into epinephrine, and the other word for epinephrine is adrenaline. So every one molecule of NutraSweet gives you one molecule of adrenaline, which can raise blood pressure, cause hyperactivity, give you nervousness, anxiety, irritability. Those are all nasty symptoms, but the real big symptoms come here when dopamine is, is produced in too high levels into the substantia nigra and not enough antioxidants. That can lead to Parkinsonism, and uh, these two can go into the memory centers in the brain and affect maybe Alzheimer's disease if you don't have enough antioxidants.